Uh, thanks. Yeah, so there's been a row brewing over um, trans rights um, and particularly around the changes to the Gender Re Recognition Act um, for several years now. And I first wrote about this about three years ago in the Socialist Review. And we actually thought at that time that by now this would have been resolved, that there would have been reforms, the, you know, the consultations would have taken place and that the general mood um, at the time was that uh, people were generally in favour of reforming the Gender Recognition Act to recognise you know, the difficulties that existed still within it for trans people and their ability to easily um, kind of get a gender recognition certificate or get the kind of paperwork that they might need um, you know, for official purposes and so on. Actually, three years on, you know, uh, uh, as you'll know, this row is still continuing. There's been all kinds of delays. The um, uh, consultations have been delayed. You know, this happened uh, for quite a long time in, in the UK, the, the UK wide consultation, but also I know in Scotland, the same thing has happened. Um, that uh, the kind of proposed changes, which would have, which we absolutely um, should, should be in favour of, um, have been pushed back, backtracked upon, you know, the Tory governments of the last few years have, um, you know, kept pushing things back. Um, and I think it's worth just going through a bit of the history of the Gender Recognition Act, the kind of reforms we, that people have talked about, and then what it is that's happened, you know, the kind of backlash and the transphobic arguments that have come up in the last few years, and what we should say about that um, as socialists. Because I think, you know, the Gender Recognition Act probably passed a lot of us by back in 2004 when it when it was first passed. It was quite a progressive piece of legislation. It allowed trans people to have their desired gender officially recognised without having had to have gone through surgery, for example, which, which was previously a precondition. You know, and I think that's really important because it recognises a reality for lots of trans people who actually don't necessarily feel that surgery is necessary for them to, to be the person they are. Um, for some people, it's about changing your name and your pronouns and, and how you live and how you are, you know, perceived by the people around you. It might be about taking hormones. It might be about all kinds of things short of surgery, you know, and for some people surgery as well. And of course, it's not easy to get the surgery that, that people talk about. It's a massive waiting list. And this has been exacerbated um, by coronavirus, but also by the climate in the last few years. You know, but the Act of 2004 does have huge limitations. In order to be granted a gender recognition certificate, a trans person has to present their case to a gender recognition panel, which is like a judicial body um, that legally determines what gender a person is. Um, the person seeking to change their officially recognised gender has to be diagnosed with gender dysphoria, you know, like a medical condition, um, to, and to have lived as their desired gender for at least two years. You know, this starts to sound like, a, you know, a, a lot of hoops to jump through and actually quite difficult um, hoops, you know, to, to live as your um, desired gender without being recognised officially as that is, is not necessarily an easy thing to do. Um, they also have to state that they intend to live with um, their new gender for the rest of their lives, you know, a big commitment um, for someone to make. And all of that adds up to uh, a lot of difficulties, accessing services, or just being recognised as your desired ge uh, gender, really, until you jump through all of those hoops. And also the bill doesn't, uh, the Act doesn't recognise um, non-binary um, identities. So, you know, it, it allows you to, to change your gender, but only between male and female. Um, so it's limited in various ways, and there are all these kind of hoops that you have to jump through. The proposed changes would mean that those seeking a gender recognition certificate won't have to be diagnosed with a condition, you know, won't have to convince a panel of so-called experts um, who've never met them before, won't have to uh, wait two years, you know, would be able to kind of self-declare their gender, um, you know, fill out lots of forms and, and all the rest of it, um, but the process would be easier um, than it currently is. Now, obviously, changing legislation like that, it doesn't end transphobia, it doesn't make everything all right um, for people. Uh, laws don't do that. But what it does, or what it could do, 
is remove some of the stress, some of the time, some of the money as well. You know, one the one concession that, that the UK government has made so far is to reduce the cost um, of, of a gender recognition certificate, certificate down from 130 quid or something down to five, five pounds. Um, but it saves a lot of emotional turmoil, I think, for people who wish to have their identity formally and kind of socially recognised in the only way that it's possible to do that at the moment uh, for formal and bureaucratic purposes. This is the only way the state allows you to do that. And so I think everyone who wants to challenge oppression um, should recognise the reality of transphobia that people face, and I'll come on to some of that now, um, and really support any action that can make life easier rather than harder for people who are facing that oppression. You know, that's our starting point, I think, for, for supporting the Gender Recognition um, Act reforms. It's, as I said, I mean, really before the changes were proposed, but certainly in the last three years, um, we've seen a huge kind of transphobic backlash against um, the discussions that have been taking place, um, particularly in the right wing media, of course, you know, there's been stories constantly in papers like the, the Telegraph, the Sunday Times, um, the Mail, uh, and so on, attacking trans people, scaremongering about predatory males or um, or about children being whisked off to the gender uh, clinic as soon as they express an interest in football or whatever. You know, just kind of um, belittling the struggles that people really do go through and uh, scaremongering on a massive scale. And it isn't just a free and fair exchange of views, you know, it isn't just Ju Julie Birchall's allowed to say what she likes in, in the Observer or whatever. It's, it has consequences, you know, and I think when you look at the studies that have been done in the past few years and the, the statistics, it's, it's quite horrific. So Stonewall Scotland has a report on the trans experience in Britain in 2018. Um, it was a, a big survey which found that one in eight trans employees has been physically attacked by a colleague or customer in the previous year. So just in one year, 12% of people have been uh, physically attacked. Half of trans people have hidden their identity at work. A quarter have experienced homelessness. 44% avoid certain streets because they don't feel safe walking along. You know, um, the numbers of murders of trans people uh, uh, globally has, has leaped up really in, in the last um, few years. We've seen in the UK large rises in reported hate crimes against trans people. And just over the past 80, uh, 15 months, whatever it is, the, the impact of the pandemic and the lockdowns has, has also been you know, quite devastating in terms of access to counselling, medical intervention, waiting times for first appointments at, at gender clinics, um, and now like several years really, uh, and already were uh, up to two years before um, the pandemic. Um, all of these things add up to life getting harder and more difficult every day um, for, uh, for trans people. Now, the Tory government in Westminster has used this opportunity to backtrack. You know, when they proposed the changes or when the changes were proposed, the government was quite generally favourable towards them. They've used this backlash to, to backtrack and add this kind of anti-trans rhetoric to a whole host of other, you know, um, quite nasty um, policies in terms of racism uh, uh, and so on that we've seen in the past few years. Um, and sadly, actually, of course, the SNP has been much more positive around the idea of LGBT liberation. You know, there's certainly this idea that in Scotland, it's a, a great place to be gay or to be non-binary or trans to, you know, that it's a, a really progressive place. But actually, the SNP has allowed all kinds of delays uh, to take place to the public consultation and, you know, just pushing back any changes that might come out of it. They blamed this on COVID, but, you know, there's an article in The National um, points out that they'd already backtracked, really, on, on several key things, on um, recognition of non-binary identities, on lowering the age at which gender can be recognised from 18 to 16, um, and on eliminating the two-year waiting period for a gender recognition certificate. So, you know, some of the uh, really good proposals have already been dropped. And, and I think, you know, now is not the time to dither over these questions and allow things to just kind of slide along. 
the right is on the offensive. Um, in the US, there are currently about 100 anti-trans bills being pushed through dozens of state legislatures by Republicans backed by ultra-conservative and far-right Christian um, organisations, things like the Alliance Defending Freedom, the Heritage Foundation, the Family Research Council. Uh, you know, I think when you add it in to, to the kind of the confidence that we've seen among the far right and the right around the globe in the past few years, it's part of an agenda. You know, transphobia is part of this agenda. Um, trans rights and women's rights, LGBT plus rights in general, you know, are under serious assault by bigots and, and by the right internationally. And I think attacks on the right to protest, you know, attacks on the idea of of people's right to, to be who they are, it, are very, very serious, you know, have also provoked people to fight back, you know, and, and part of the reason I think the backlash against trans rights has been so vicious is precisely because there's been such an inspiring fight by trans people and, uh, uh, you know, and their supporters to, um, to shift the narrative to kind of, you know, put all kinds of new arguments onto the agenda um, around questions of gender, sexuality, um, and, and so on. But I think that wider context is why it's so concerning for me that, that some on the left, you know, a minority of feminists, trade unionists and so on, have taken a position that somehow trans rights and self-ID in particular are an attack on women's rights, you know, or in conflict with women's rights. And I think this is an argument that, again, has been brewing for, for three years or more but has really taken off, you know, in the last few months, the last week, you know, where we've seen the, the court decision in favour of, um, of Mayor Forstatter, you know, d protecting her rights to, to kind of spew this transphobic um, stuff on social media and elsewhere. And I know, you know, people in, in Glasgow will know more about this than me, but some of those arguments have come up in the new Alba party, haven't they? People who seem like they've left the SNP in order to become you know, join a party where they can be more openly transphobic, maybe. I mean, one of the arguments that you hear is that uh, allowing self-ID would allow predatory men to claim that they're women so they can go into women's prisons and abuse people, um, and this makes women unsafe, or that they can go into women's toilets and uh, attack people and so on. And I think these kind of arguments are really disingenuous. You know, when they started out a couple of years ago, it would be, you know, uh, predatory men could take advantage of this change. I think now they don't even bother with that polite separation. It's just that trans women are men and therefore are naturally predatory and, and uh, not safe in uh, women's or single sex spaces. But, in, you know, in the case of, for example, toilets, uh, public toilets, it's it completely ignores the reality of the situation, which firstly, that trans people have, of course, been using the appropriate toilets for decades. And there are no cases that I've heard of, of this kind of myth of the predatory uh, male who uses the opportunity to attack women. Men have attacked women in public toilets, I'm sure. But, you know, there's nothing to do with um, uh, trans people. But more importantly, um, it's actually trans women in particular who feel most unsafe in public toilets. You know, the, in a, that survey by Stonewall, found that almost half, 48% of, of the uh, trans people surveyed said they don't feel safe using public toilets for fear of harassment and discrimination. And that's precisely, you know, the, the process that is going on, that these arguments, they're not just theoretical arguments. They have consequences in the real world for people. They make people afraid and they make people um, uh, fear for their um, safety. Um, and I want to come on just, you know, to this question of, really um, gender, biology, sex, and so on. You know, I think people get tangled up in this. Um, there is a mainstream view of sex and gender, of course, that they're just the same thing, that women are naturally caring, submissive, good with children, and so on. Men are naturally outgoing, stronger, more domineering, uh, etc. This upholds the status quo, it upholds the idea of the, you know, the hierarchy of the family, um, uh, and all the rest of it. And anyone who doesn't fit with that, is, is a problem uh, for the nuclear family, you know, whether that is because they're gay or trans or gender non-conforming or whatever. I think for the kind of anti-trans or gender critical um, feminists as they call themselves, 
they might not accept this, you know, the kind of mainstream celebration of the family, but they absolutely end up excluding trans people by saying that we have to talk about biological facts and to support self ID or to include trans women in the category of women is to ignore reality. But I think that it's a really, that is a really mechanical and wrong way of looking at the idea of, um, of how we understand um, sex and gender. You know, biological sex, after all, is, is a human concept. It's something that, you know, it's a set of criteria that we as a society have decided are important and have grouped together in particular ways. You know, um, it's, you know, using different indicators, biologies, anatomies, you know, chromosomes, etc. These, these indicators have changed over time and will continue to and have changed when there are scientific discoveries or, or whatever. The concept of biological sex isn't inevitable just because we have bodies and they exist. Okay, it's, it's a response to how we see those bodies, how we decide what's important in terms of how we categorize people in, in our society. You know, so the whole argument, you know, I keep hearing this argument that it's about science, you know, that, that people who support trans rights are ignore, ignoring the science, but it's not really an argument about science. It's an argument about categories of people and how we decide what ones are valid and what ones are important uh, and so on. For me, there is no problem uh, expanding the concept of woman to include trans women. You know, I don't understand the problem with doing this because, you know, it's not simply a, a fact. It's something that socially is kind of uh, agreed upon. The important question for us is who decides, who benefits, in whose interests was the kind of the, these binaries um, imposed on us and uh, came to dominate so thoroughly the way that we organise as a society. You know, and the way that we have to work so hard to even recognise a lot of the time the ideological role that the family plays, that, that gender plays in our society, in deciding how children are raised, you know, how, how certain individuals are meant to act, uh, the expectations that we should have, and so on. Uh, and it's everywhere, isn't it? This idea of the family. Um, I don't know if people saw the ridiculous kind of set of um, policy concepts. I don't know what they are really that the Labour Party came out with today. Uh, number five was a future where families come first. You know, and this is one of those phrases that is kind of utterly meaningless, but also really, really heavy with ideological baggage at the same time. You know, it's one of those phrases that hangs on the way that we organize as a society. Um, and the family is at the center of everything, you know, that is sold to us um, uh, in our society. Uh, you know, things are sold to us as either they're gonna help us find a mate or they're going to help us provide for our family once we've got one. You know, this is the main categories of advertising and of, uh, you know, uh, conceptualizing what things are for in our society. And that is the real root of women's oppression. And ultimately, it's the same route as trans oppression, you know, uh, this idea of, of uh, gender and uh, the roles that we play inside the family, the division of labor, the privatization of reproduction, the gender roles that come from that, the family as a unit of consumption, you know, particularly since, um, since the Second World War. Um, you know, and for that reason, there is no contradiction that I can see between women's rights and trans rights. They're rooted in the same social relations and ones that we all will benefit from challenging. Um, overcoming dam damaging gender expectations, winning better access to, um, to healthcare and services that are appropriate for each individual's needs, um, gaining autonomy over our bodies. All of these things would benefit all of us actually, and particularly will benefit women, uh, you know, all women, um, uh, trans or not. I think also in this in this um, context, we should absolutely celebrate all of the new movements and the new ideas and language that are developing around questions of gender. You know, trying to go beyond the the binaries of of male and female, and talk about you know either a proliferation of genders or you know getting rid of gender or, or whatever uh, the aim may be. Actually, all of those debates and discussions I think are, are really inspiring and help to break down the binaries that are so damaging. I think the trade union movement for several years now um, has been taking up trans rights, you know, and making it a, a central and integral part of their um, work against um, oppression. 
and the liberation campaigning. And I think that's really, really positive. And where we need to have arguments in unions to get those policies through, we should do that. And that's part, um, part of our role as socialists. And I think we have to absolutely fight across um, Britain for progressive reform of the Gender Recognition Act. You know, we need to fight for things that will make life easier and not harder for people who are facing a huge amount of oppression on a daily basis. Um, and not allow this to be pushed back any further, not allow it to be watered down or, you know, just ignored altogether, um, which I think is what our government in Westminster would like to do. But we also know, I hope, that we can't rely on any government, you know, even if it's a more progressive one, you know, or on any law by itself to deliver um, the kind of rights that people need and certainly not to deliver the kind of liberation that we all really need. You know, solidarity begins on the ground. And if we're ever going to create the kind of world where women don't have to face sexual harassment, where um, racism isn't able to poison our communities, you know, where all of the kind of divisions um, that, are, that are created in our society aren't able to grow, uh, and where trans people and everyone are able to have, have control over their own bodies, really, then we have to start from recognising the reality of the oppression that people are facing today and standing shoulder to shoulder with them um, in, the ch in the challenge to that. You know, I think that whole period where Trump was in charge and people having to fight for just the basic idea that it's not okay to be sexually assaulted uh, by the president or your boss or anyone else, you know, that people came out and fought over those questions and that trans people have been part of fights over the past few years, which have made all of these questions so much more visible you know, that is what allow, is allowing us to have these discussions. Uh, but no one gets the right to debate, uh, you know, um, what kind of society we should have in the future, what kind of rights we should be fighting for if they're not standing shoulder to shoulder with people facing oppression in the here and now on a daily basis. And I think that's where we start. And that's the basis for building the bigger movements that we need in the future.